going to be in James chapter 2 for our study time, our sermon time this morning. Uh, so if you have a Bible, we'd love for you to turn there, James, in the second chapter uh, this morning, James chapter 2. And just before we sort of jump into that chapter, there's a couple of scriptures that we're going to put up on the screen for you here this morning that I would like to share with you. Uh, so we're going to put those up now. The first one is in Isaiah. Isaiah, do we have that? We, it's not on there. Okay, okay, we're, it's not on there. Anyway, we're going to turn to them then, as long as I can remember where they are. Isaiah chapter, let's try Isaiah chapter 27. Isaiah chapter 27. Keep your finger in, uh, in James, Isaiah chapter 27. That's not it. Um, not it, not it. Anyway, anyway, I'll find it here eventually. The first one is in Isaiah, and if we, we don't turn there, that is, uh, that is okay. But in Isaiah, uh, the, the Lord is, is talking to, to Israel, and he, he's speaking to Israel, and, and speaking to Isaiah, and, and one of the things he says to them that we're going to sort of focus on this morning through some different passages through James is, is this. He says, they honor me with their uh, appearances. They honor me with who they are. They, they uh, come to the synagogue and they, they spend time in the synagogue. They make their sacrifices. And then he says this. He says, their lips are far or their, their words are close, their lips are, are close, but their, their deeds are far from me. Their deeds are far, far from me. They honor me with their lips, they say all sorts of great things, but then they go home, and you've never experienced this before, but then they go home and they, they settle into their own lives, they settle into their own routines, they, they uh, don't do anything that, that I would ask of them during the week, but, but every, every time that there's an opening in the temple, every time they come to offer sacrifices, uh, they are there. They are there. Now, we're going to turn to the back of the Bible here to Revelation. I know where this one is. So, the book of Revelation. And chapter 3. Revelation and chapter 3. And we're going to read a couple of verses from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. And this is what it says. It says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea writes, The faithful, or the amen, the faithful, the true, and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. So this is uh, the Lord speaking through John, who wrote Revelation, to a church in the city of Laodicea, and he says this, I know your deeds, I know your deeds, that they are neither hot, a cold, nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Verse 16, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And he goes on in verse 17, he says, Because you say, I am rich and I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So that's God's word to a church in the city of Laodicea, uh, speaking through the Apostle John. And, uh, and, and there are a couple things that are interesting about Laodicea. Laodicea was an extremely, extremely rich city. They, they had wealth. Uh, beyond you know anybody's expectation, wealth beyond uh, all measure. In fact, at one point in their history, a uh, devastating earthquake came over the, the territory, came over that, that city, and pretty much decimated the whole city. It was just a complete ruin. And so Rome uh, sent ambassadors and sent people to Laodicea and said to them, look, we're, we're going to send help, we're going to send money, we're going to send everything you, you need to, to fix up your city and to get it back. To, to, you know, the standard it was at. And, and they, they were so proud, not only so proud, but, but also so rich, that they said to Rome, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, in fact, we'll do it ourselves. We have the funds, we have the resources. And, and so from pretty much scratch, they rebuilt that entire city full of, of stadiums, full of theaters. It was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful city. And in other words, they, they sort of spat in the face of Rome and said, I am rich, we are rich, we can take care of it ourselves. And it was a church in, in that city 
And the Lord says to that church a, a couple things specifically that, that we, we want to focus on. Verse 15, he says, I know your deeds. In other words, I see everything. I see what's happening. I, I hear what you, you say, and I, I see what you're like. And he says, you're, you're not hot, you're not cold. And in fact, in, in verse 16 of, of that, that chapter, Revelation chapter 3, uh, he says, I will spit you out of my mouth. That word spit, it, it means to spew. It, it really means to vomit. And in fact, as, as God observed the church in that city and everything that was happening in that city, uh, it, it says that, that he just made him sick. So sick that, that he wanted to vomit. The, the church out of his mouth, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy. And I think the, the thing that sort of tips us off is, is to the real problem in verse 17, after it says, I become wealthy, he says, and have need of nothing. In other words, we, we don't have need of anything here in Laodicea. We have it all. We can take care of ourselves. Now, James chapter 2. James chapter 2, if you, uh, if you would this morning, this is a, a really important, a really crucial part in the, the book of, of James, and we're going to, to begin in verse 14, James 2 verse 14, and this is what James says to us. He says, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but has no works? What use is, is it if someone says he has faith but has no works, then James says, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, yet do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? And so this is a very important part in, in James' book, in, in James' writing, and, and James has a, a main point. We're going to give you the main point right, right away. And, and the point is, is simply this. James claims, James says, James teaches us that faith, uh, a faith without works, a faith without deeds, uh, a faith without living, is a, a faith that is a dead faith. And in other words, we, we might say today that, that talk is cheap. That's what James is saying. Talk is, is cheap. We can say all sorts of cute little things, but the talk is cheap. And, and a, a faith that is all talk, a, a faith that is, is all words without action, is a, a faith that is dead. And, and James asked a, a really important question, a really interesting question. He says uh, simply there in, in verse 14 at the end, he says, Can that faith, can the faith that has no works, no deeds attached to it, can that faith save someone? And the answer is no, it cannot. That kind of a faith cannot save someone. And so James goes on to give a little bit of illustration about what he's talking about, to, to give us a, a picture or a story to, to help us connect his, his thoughts, help us connect what, what he's thinking. And, and the story is, is right there in the text. We, we read it, um, and, and imagine this. He, he says, imagine that, that you've met someone Imagine that you've met someone on the corner, met someone in need. Imagine that you're walking down the street with a, a loaf of bread in your hand. And, uh, and, and you see someone, uh, it says in verse 15, a brother and sister is without clothing or in need of, of daily food. And, and imagine that you say to that person, one of you says, go in peace. And in other words, uh, the, the word they would have used is shalom. Shalom, shalom. And, and that, that means, uh, shalom means peace, and it was a common uh, way of, of sort of ending a conversation as two people that have been talking, parted, uh, often the Hebrew people would say shalom, or, or peace be with you, is, is what they were saying. And, and so imagine that, that you find someone in need of, of clothing, um, imagine you find someone in need of um, food, uh, other necessities that we might have today, like coffee, um, imagine you find someone in need of coffee. This is, is what, what James is, is sort of picturing. He says, what do you say to them? Shalom or, or peace be with you. Be warm and be filled. 
That is, you said something with your words. Be warm and, and be filled. So you have no clothes. So the person says, be warm. You have no food. So the person says, be filled. And do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? We, today, 2019, it, it might sound something like this. It might sound something like, God be with you. We'll pray for you. You know, ever heard had someone say, you know, God provides all of your needs. And, and you know, that is, is true, but maybe that's why God sent the person to you, so that you could provide that need on, on God's behalf. And, and so James is saying, talk is cheap. Uh, imagine finding someone in need. Imagine having the resources to meet that need. Uh, imagine having that loaf of bread in, in your hand. Uh, imagine having access to the things that you have to help someone, and, and, and instead of going along, and instead of helping them, instead of providing and, and caring for them, you say to them, God be with you, uh, peace be with you, be, be warm, be filled, we'll pray for that, brother, we'll pray for that, sister, uh, let, let, let's just hope that God provides that need for you. And, and James is sort of pointing this question at us when it comes to, to works and, and faith. And, and James is saying, can that kind of a faith, can the, the kind of a faith that, that is all talk and, and no action, can that kind of a faith save someone? The answer is no. He says in verse 17 of chapter 2, even so faith if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Remember the story of the, the Good Samaritan. I'm sure you all remember it. And here's a, a man, um, and this is a parable story Jesus is telling again to make kind of a, a main point. But uh, a man is in, in desperate need. He, he's been uh, caught by robbers and, and beaten and thrown uh, to the side of the road and, and left to, to dead. And, and you know how the story goes. Several people pass by. Several people are, you know, could, could help. Several people have the resources and, and the, the time and, and the things needed to help this man. And, and as they're, they're going by, uh, every single one of them finds an excuse. Every, every single one of them finds a reason not, not to stop. And until we, we get to the Samaritan. And, and the, the fact that the Samaritan would, would even stop and help is a, another whole story in it on its own. But one of the people that walked by in, in that, that story, one of the people that passed on by was a, a priest. And, and the priest didn't have time to stop. The priest couldn't stop be, because he was going to the temple. He was going to offer someone or a, a, an offering to God. He, he was going to worship God at the temple. And, and there's a couple reasons. First of all, he probably didn't have time. At least he thought he didn't. You know, like, I, I've got to get to Jerusalem. I'm going up to Jerusalem. And, and if I stop, this is going to be really inconvenient. Not only that, but, but to touch a body that was bloody and, and bruised and, and in the kind of shape that the, the man on the side of the road was, it would have meant that, that he would have been uh, ritually unclean to, to go and, and do what he needed to do at the temple. And, and so he, he, he kind of looks and he notices and he, he passes by and, and he says, I, I don't have time to stop, I don't have time to help even though I see someone in need because I am on my way um, to, to worship God. I am on my way to worship the Lord at the, the temple of Jerusalem. And, and you know what James would say to that story that was sort of tucked in here and into his book? James would say that that kind of faith is, is a sham. That, that kind of faith isn't, isn't real. That kind of faith that makes no difference, that has no impact, that, that doesn't affect in a, a positive kind of a way the, the people uh, around them. That kind of a faith is, is just, it doesn't exist. It, it's not real. And, and, you know, he would say, does that kind of a faith save someone? Does that kind of a faith save someone? James would say, no, it does not. No, it does not. There's a, a, a passage in Matthew chapter 7. I told you we're, we're going to flip around here a little bit this morning. You can turn there if, uh, if you want. Matthew chapter 7. I 
think this is the right, the right passage. Matthew chapter 7. See, I'm, I'm going all off memory here now. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to find this one. Yeah, because this one's really important. Matthew chapter 7 and, and verse 21. Okay, I want you to, to see these, these verses. These, these are, are very, very important verses. Now, just look here. Matthew 7, 21. This is Jesus talking um, to, to people that are, are claiming to be his followers, claiming to be his disciples. And he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, just let's pause here for a moment and, and just try to understand the, the impact of the statement that Jesus is making to his, his readers, to his original listeners, and, and to us. Not everyone... That, that comes and says, Lord, Lord, uh, will enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, there's people that will claim to be followers of Jesus. There's people that will claim to walk in the ways of Jesus. There's people that would say, if we can sort of bring it into our context today, uh, I went to church every Sunday, I served in a church all the time. There's people that, that would praise me with their lips. There's people that would say, oh, bless you, bless you, yes, uh, I believe this, I believe that. There's people that will say, Lord, Lord, but will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It gets worse after that. Who enters the kingdom of heaven? But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. So in other words, talk is cheap. We can say a bunch of things with our lips. You know, we, we can say the right Christian stuff. We can say the right lingo, have the right words. But the, the one who actually enters the kingdom of heaven is the one who does the will of, of the, the Father. Now look at verse 22. And, and, and folks... Um, you know, I was when I was getting this ready a few weeks ago and just looking at this, uh, I just thought to myself, you know, these are our powerful verses. These are our verses for, for church people. These are our verses for, for Christians. Look at it, verse 22. Many will say to me all that day, so when, when all time is ended and, and we stand before the Lord and, and, and here we are gathered together, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? In your name. And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform miracles. These are our people that at least by, by every, you know, all appearances are aligned with the kingdom of God. They prophesy, they cast out demons, they have done miracles, all these things. And, and so um, they're, they're expecting that when the, the judgment time comes, when the final day has arrived, when, when everybody is, is is together, um, is, is a passage talks about when the, the Lord sorts out the goats from the, the lambs, they're expected that they will, will enter into the kingdom of God because they have done all these things in, in the name of the Lord. And, and then it, it says, uh, it says, and perform many miracles, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Do you understand the, the importance of what James is saying and what Matthew is saying and what Revelation and Isaiah are saying when it, it comes to, to faith and, and good deeds and good works and we could, you know, discipleship and following in the, the ways of, of Jesus do you, do you understand how important it is um, to, to see how closely these things are connected? And what James is saying, and, and understandably, and, and he's trying to make a point, he's a little lopsided, and other passages would, would sort of um, you know, balance this a little bit more, but James is saying you can't have faith without works. In other words, if you've truly been transformed, if, if the Holy Spirit has truly come into your heart and, and done something, uh, done a miracle, done something miraculous, miraculous, took that heart of stone and, and turned it towards the Lord, if that has truly happened in, in your life, then the transformation will take place. Something will be different. 
followed by that will be acts of, of good works, things that, that Jesus would want us to do. Things like, like loving one another. Things like, like being kind to our neighbors, not just kind like everybody is, but kind in the Jesus sort of a kind. Things like, like following righteousness and following after the Lord. James is saying, if faith has really taken place in your heart, works will follow at some point. Um, to, to try to maybe illustrate it this way, imagine that you, you bought a, a new house. Anybody here bought a new house in the last while? I know a couple of people have. Anyway, now just, just imagine you, you bought a, a new house, and, and out in the front of that house was a, a tree. And, uh, and, and you, you had a conversation with the previous owners, and they said, well, yes, um, you know, beautiful tree. It's an apple tree. And so you're thinking, I love apples. You know, this is great. And, and so you're in your, your new house, and you're all settled in. And as, as fall time uh, approaches, you are anxious, you are excited to, to get apples off of that apple tree. And, and so you, you, you're watching, but after the, the first fall has kind of come and, and gone, um, you, you're extremely disappointed because your, your tree has not produced a single apple. You say, well, you know, maybe it was just a, a bad year, maybe the weather wasn't right, maybe the frost got to the buds early, so there was just no apples on this tree. Um, surely next year will be a better year for, for apples. And so next year, you, you are waiting again and, and just excited to get those apples, but after the, the fall again comes and the fall again goes, you, you have um, no apples from your tree. And you're, you're pretty frustrated because you just love apples. And so a third fall comes. And, and you know, as, as before fall, spring comes, you're, you're watching closely and, and you're making sure, checking to see if, if the tree has started to bud yet. And, and, and just anxious, you know, surely this will be the year where you have a bumper crop of apples. And, and at some point, you know, that fall comes and it's gone again. And for a third straight year, you have no apples. And, and the, the point of, of this is at some point, you have to, to look at yourself. You have to, to look at, at your situation. You have to look at your tree and, and say, someone has deceived me. Because this is not an apple tree. And it's not maybe that they deceived you intentionally, uh, you know, but, but at some point you have to look at what you have and look at the fruit and, and look at it, what's being produced and say, you know what, this is not an apple tree. I don't know what kind of tree it is, but it's not an apple tree because I've been here three, four, five, six years and we haven't got a single apple. What James is saying that if we have had true faith experience, if Jesus has come and regenerated our hearts and regenerated our souls, then our faith must at some point amount to more than just talking. Our faith must at some point amount to more than just honoring God with our lips. Our faith must at some point uh, amount more than, than just saying, Lord, I did this in your name, I did this in your name, I did this in your name. And, and you know what, someday we, we may stand before, before the Lord, and, and hopefully this isn't the case, and, and say, uh, and, and have him say to us, I didn't, even, I didn't know you. Your lips were close to me, but your heart was far, far from me. And, and I think what is, is so discouraging and, and so sad and, and surprising about the, the passage in, in Matthew is that they thought that they were close to the Lord. They thought that they were walking close to the Lord. They thought that all that day they were just going to sort of a free pass and, and enter along with everyone else into the, through the pearly gates and, and into heaven. But on that day they were surprised because Jesus says, I never knew you. I, knew, I know your deeds. I, I know what you're doing. I, I hear your words and I know your deeds. And your heart is far from me. Um, you know, you know and I know some people um, that their words don't mean a whole lot. You know those kinds of people? 
And, and they're, they're quick to, to point things out, and they're quick to share an opinion, and they're quick to, to, to praise, and they're quick to say this, and they're quick to say that. But uh, after, when you sort of step back and reflect and, and look at their lives, what, what you, you can sort of pick out and, and see is that as, as much as their words are quick and their, their words are, are fluent, that their, their lives and their, their bodies, uh, you know, their bodies are not as quick to move. You know, they're not as quick to action. They're not as quick to carry out. In other words, they have a lot to say, but their, their, their lives, their deeds don't consistently match up with the things that they say. And, and James would say, when that is consistent in your life, and what you're saying and what you're doing consistently don't match up, he's saying, you know, ask yourselves this question. Does that kind of faith save you? Or is that kind of faith, like the, the situation of the priest and the story of the Good Samaritan, is it a sham? We can all play religion. And we talked about this uh, actually just a, a few weeks ago. We can all play religion. And, and here's the thing that uh, really hit me hard again as I was sort of thinking through this. Um, you know, it, it's easy, I, I think anyway, it, it's easy for a pastor... To, to play religion probably more than anyone else be, because there's so many points where, where my, my faith uh, and, and what I believe and, and you know that part of it and, and my job, what I, I do, uh, part of my calling, there's so many places where, where that uh, intersect with one another. And, and so sometimes it's hard for us all of it, but I think sometimes it's even more challenging for pastors uh, to, to sort of sort through their, their own hearts and their own lives and sort of make some distinctions. And I've always said I'm, I'm a disciple or a follower of Jesus first and pastor second. And, and, and that's an important because here's the thing. Some of the checks that may be in place for you are, are a little murkier for me. In other words, if I don't show up here on, on Sunday morning, um, people come to my door and say, Brian, where are you? You know, like, come on, get your act together. If I, if I, you know, I'm supposed to be here. This is part of my job. It's part of my calling, but it's also a part of my faith. I, I have a, it's easier for me to, to put personal checks in place because I know that if, if somebody sees me talking that way or acting that way or, or sees me doing that, that, that it, it won't just affect my faith, but it could affect my job. And, and so at the end of the day, it's easy for us all, but possibly easy, even easier for me to, to sort of enter into this game of religion where it's easy to honor God with my words, with my lips, with my preaching. And it's hard to consistently live a life where faith and works fit together. And that's what James is saying. Martin Luther, the, the great reformer, um, very much kind of his motto and, and the scriptural motto was, was faith alone. We, we come to, to God by, by faith, not by the things we do. You know, there's not a system, there's not a ladder, there's not a list of good deeds and check somebody off and, and you get into heaven. And, and so his, his motto for the Reformation, much needed, was, was faith, 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 faith alone. It has nothing to do with works. Um, he was so frustrated with James that he just tossed the book of James out. He says, James is off his rocker. I don't even think it should be part of Scripture. This is true. Uh, be, because, you know, James seems to push back uh, against what, what Luther believed in and what Luther was correct in believing. But what James is saying is that faith and works go together as a pair. Faith and works go together like a hand and a, and a glove. They, they should have, be a, a perfect fit. For it's easy to talk, and it's easy to praise, and it's easy to say, but if what we believe and what we say about our God makes no difference in our, our everyday life, and the everyday life of our churches, our communities, our works, what is the point? Now, just a couple more things, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. Um, James chapter 2, I got away from there, I'm back there now. Let's just sort of finish out what, what James is, is saying here. Verse 18 of chapter 2, he says, But someone may well say, You have faith, and I will show you works 
show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith uh, by my works. And, and James is saying, um, in, in verse 18, it's a little hard to follow without taking the time to really break it down, but, but this is what he's saying. My works, what I do, prove to people, show to people, or at least they should show to people, that my faith and what I believe is real. That's what he's saying. Do our works, do our deeds, show to people that our faith is real. Verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well, the demons also believe and shudder. And, and so in other words, you believe in God, congratulations, that's a good start, that's a foundation piece. But, but guess what, if that's all you're hanging your hat on, the demons also believe in God. And, and so again, just he, he points that, that out. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? It's useless. And they have to go together as a pair. Let me just finish um, with two questions this morning to, to ask you, and, and I would love for you to think about and consider and, and sort of just reflect on uh, for the next uh, six, seven days. Question number one is simply this. Is the gap, is the gap between what we say and what we do narrowing or widening? In other words, we're not perfect, I'm not perfect, and you're not perfect, and we all have sort of gaps in our lives where what we say uh, and, and what we do are, are not consistent with one another. You know, there, there's a little bit of a space there, it shouldn't be that way, but because we're not perfect, there is. But the, the question I would love for you to, to think about and answer is, is the gap between those two places, what we say over here and, and what we do over here, is that as we grow in our faith getting smaller? Or are we being more consistent between our words and our deeds? Or, or is it getting larger? Is, is the, the gap widening between what we say and what we do? Or, or is it narrow? And James would say that if your faith is real, if your faith is alive, then that gap ought to, to be narrowing. What we say ought to be consistent with what we do, because what we do proves and shows that our faith is alive. Here's a, the second, second question that I want to ask you. There's a little trick here, and it's going to take a, a little bit more for you to think about, but, but it's important. Um, can you name three things? Can you name at least three different ways in your life, in, in your day-to-day your -day lives, can you name at least three different ways that, that things that demonstrate, that show that your faith is alive? Can you list or name three different ways or three different things that you've got going on in, in your life that show and demonstrate that your faith is alive? Now, uh, for some of you wrote down, yes, I'm here this morning, cross that off. Here's why. Why? That is lip service. That, that is words. But, but can we uh, name three different things, active things in our life that say to, you, to others, that show to others that our, our faith is alive? So let me give you some examples. Um, we, we get excited about digging into and studying the word of God. Because if our faith is alive, what Jesus says through his word is, is important, and, and it, it's life-giving, and, it, and it's exciting to get into it and study it and be a part of it. So are we excited uh, about studying the, the word of God? That would be one example. Um, see, you're starting to see why sometimes it's hard for pastors to distinguish the, these, these two elements, be, because uh, that's, again, part of my faith. It's part of my job. But, but are we excited to dig into the Word of God? What are some things, and can you name two or three different things in your life that demonstrate to other people that your faith is more than just words, that your faith is more than just what you say from the pew, what you say from the pulpit, what you say on your Facebook, what you say here, what you say at your work, but that it's alive from what you Let's bow together in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, boy, this is a challenging, challenging area.
to find consistency between what we believe, what we say we believe, and what we do uh, with our actions. Lord, and I know, speaking personally, that there are many gaps in, in my life that need to be brought closer together. And I suspect that there's many people here that feel the same way. But Lord, I, I pray that more consistently we would be seen as people that not just know of, of the faith, but that live of faith. That not just speak of the love of Jesus, but that show the love of Jesus. That uh, not just talk uh, about how Jesus uh, died for, for our sin, but, but Lord, live that and, and share that with others. Lord, not people that just give speech to something we've been taught, but that demonstrate we know the truth of it with the way that we live our lives. Lord, would you help us? And would you guide us? Lord, would you help us to see that what we believe and what we do are, are not to be separated, but they, that they are together. That they are the, the perfect couple, that they fit together. And that it is through what we do that we can show and prove that what we believe is real and has transformed our hearts and our lives. Lord, we ask these things in your name. Amen.